My name is Nicholas Griffin, and my book is called Ping Pong Diplomacy, The Secret History Behind the Game That Changed the World. I went to the Beijing Olympics in 2008, and as a journalist, I was handed a press packet. And one of the statistics was 300 million Chinese play table tennis every week in China. And if you know anything about China, you know that everything is top down rather than bottom up. So it seemed such an obvious question. How could someone have given the order for everybody to play table tennis? What a strange thing. I started digging around, and one of the first people I spoke to said, well, none of that would have been possible without one Englishman, Ivor Montague. And the most bizarre thing of, of all for me was that his family are close family friends of my family. One of the things I found out while doing the research for this book was that instead of ping pong being this suddenly political uh, thing in 1971, it had this long history dating right back to its birth as a sport. And that was thanks to this very strange character called Ivor Montague, who was the son of an English baron. He was the producer of Alfred Hitchcock's movies, especially the ones on espionage. Uh, and he was also a spy for, for, for the Soviets, especially during the Second World War. And one of the things he wanted to do was smuggle through culture, uh, communist ideas, into the West. And he believed that ping pong was one of the things that capable of doing that, a sport for the working classes. One of the things you realize uh, is that in, in, in New China, starting in, in 49, was that everything was political. And that, as strange as it may seem, included ping pong. Uh, so these men and women who, who were the first people to represent China at a gold medal level became these celebrities, but they were always slightly political celebrities. So they were used in 1961 uh, in a very deliberate way to help create this sort of fog to hide uh, some of the disasters uh, happening during the Great Leap Forward, the Great Famine. And then during the Cultural Revolution, when, when everything was flipped on its head, they were deemed guilty for, for the very things that, that had given them their success just a few years before. So they became, as political personages, they were prosecuted. And three of them were driven to their deaths or murdered, depending on who you believe. Ping pong was so obviously political by 1970s that there's a moment in, in 71 when there's, even though there's constant contact between the team and reporting straight back to the Premier of China, Zhou Enlai at the time, they disobey his instructions. He's told a player to lose to a North Korean because it's a personal favor done to the North Korean Premier. But they forget to lose because he's the last player surviving. They think the Premier would actually prefer that he wins the whole tournament. Uh, so he beats the North Korean. When they return to Beijing, they're called in to see the Premier, Zhou Enlai, and they're sent on a mission of shame to apologize. Uh, and they have to go to North Korea. Uh, and it's a highly embarrassing moment for them, but they are forgiven. In the spring of 1971, the American table tennis team traveled to compete in Nagoya, Japan, in the World Table Tennis Championships. And the Chinese were going to go there to compete for the first time since the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. And this could be a very awkward moment uh, that the Americans and the Chinese, there'd been no official contact for almost 22 years. And yet suddenly, one afternoon in Nagoya, the Chinese table tennis squad approached the Americans and asked them if they would like to visit Beijing immediately. And that's the moment and the precursor for this period of time known as ping pong diplomacy that brings China and US back together again. I'm not arguing that the, the there's no detente without ping pong. But ping pong is a very deliberate catalyst that really speeds things up. There are already political will on both sides. But political will doesn't really mean anything uh, if you don't have the support of your citizenry. So on the American side, Nixon was very worried about his own right wing. How, what's it going to look like when he approaches the red, red China? And in China, Mao's worried about during the Cultural Revolution, he's got to worry about his radical left, led by the Gang of Four, including his wife. Uh, so they need a catalyst and a sort of magic potion uh, to change everybody's mind about how to view the enemy. And ping pong does the, ro does the job. We all like to make things easy for ourselves to understand. And we, we, we leap to these conclusions that, that, in this case, ping pong was always considered, ping pong diplomacy was this wonderfully spontaneous moment, but my argument was that it was stage managed by the Chinese to the nth degree. Uh, and I think that's a fascinating 
thing to think about as we see Sino-U.S. relations improve over the last 40 years. Uh, you know, Kissinger has really been in control of the narrative from, from this side of the Atlantic. And I rather wanted to challenge that uh, just because I thought it wasn't the whole truth. There's no doubt Nixon and Kissinger were, were absolutely key in this process. But I think if you look at the timing and the method of delivery and the location, those three things were all controlled by the Chinese. And I think that's absolutely key.